bond enthalpy going to be the topic of this lesson. And uh, bond enthalpy, also called bond dissociation energy, uh, is simply just the energy it takes to break a bond. And if we keep track of all the bonds being broken and all the bonds being formed, we can actually tally it all up and, and get an approximation for the delta H of a reaction. So this means this actually is the third way that you now know how to calculate the delta H of a reaction. And we're going to do our best to make sure that you're not confusing this one with either of the other two. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep as well. You'll find those courses at chadsprep.com. Now, this lesson's part of my new general chemistry playlist. It's an entire year of general chemistry. We'll be releasing several lessons a week throughout the school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so bond enthalpy. and. Uh, another way to calculate delta H of a reaction, and this is actually a little bit annoying because now you've got three different tools that will all allow you to calculate delta H of a reaction. And, uh, students often forget that they've learned three different tools, and so when they're given a tool and asked to calculate delta H of a reaction, they don't even realize that they've learned more than one way and, and don't realize what the formula should be. So uh, with Hess's law, you learn how to add up a bunch of reactions and sometimes you got to reverse them, which turns the, you know, makes the delta H of that reaction negative. Sometimes you had to double them, which would double the delta H. But however you manipulate all these reactions, they have to add up to exactly the reaction you're looking for. Uh, and then you can just add up their corresponding delta H's to get the overall delta H. That's the worst case scenario. Then you learned about enthalpy of formation, which was way better. And it was just simple plug and chug, products minus reactants, done. So, well, the unfortunate thing is that this third way with bond enthalpies is going to be reactants minus products. And so you really need to understand, was I given enthalpy of formation data or was I given bond enthalpy, AKA bond dissociation energy data? Because is it products minus reactants or reactants minus products? And we'll explain why they seem a little bit backwards and stuff like that, but you absolutely need to be sure of which one you've got here. So, so it turns out that, uh, uh, you know, these bond enthalpies are simply just the energy it takes to break a bond. So it is endothermic process to break a bond and it absorb, you know, it requires the absorption of energy. It is therefore when you form a bond, when two atoms come together, it actually releases a bunch of energy and is an exothermic process. Now, students don't often struggle with, you know, the idea that breaking a bond is going to cost energy, but they might think that it actually is going to cost energy when you make a bond. No, no, when you make a bond, it actually releases energy. Two atoms come together, it lowers their energy, and the excess energy is given off. All right, so the bond enthalpy is specifically describing the energy it takes to break a bond. And so that's, uh, and we can use those because basically, you know, in a chemical reaction, we just have a whole series of bonds that are broken and formed. And if we just kind of keep a tally of how much energy was absorbed in the ones we broke and how much energy was released in the ones that we formed, we can get an approximation of delta H. Now, it turns out it really is just a really good approximation. It's not going to be exact. It turns out that the, uh, the bond enthalpies we give you here, like for a breaking a typical CH bond is 413 kilojoules per mole. Breaking a typical CCL bond is carbon chlorine bond is 328 kilojoules per mole, a typical hydrogen chlorine bond is 431 kilojoules per mole, and breaking a chlorine chlorine bond is 242 kilojoules per mole. So it turns out these are averages. So, and it turns out, I mean, the only chlorine chlorine bond that exists is just one in a, in a molecule of Cl2. So that one's actually going to kind of be fixed. But, you know, for a CH bond, that can, you know, show up in a whole different variety of molecules. And all these molecules are a little bit different. And based on how they're different, it will actually alter that number ever so slightly. And so it turns out that this number specifically um, is not very specific. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of an average of a, a bunch of situations. So when you actually do use these bond enthalpy values to calculate delta H, you're getting a really good approximation, but you're probably not getting an exact answer. Whereas when you did like Hess's law or used enthalpy of formation values, those you are getting exact values. Um, so that's kind of the deal. You should know that going, uh, going into this up front here. So all right, so since the bond enthalpy is defined as the energy it takes to break a bond, so we can actually, uh, where do you break bonds? You break them in the reactants, and that's why we're going to add up all the reactant values. But you don't form the bonds that are present in the products. You actually, I'm sorry, you don't break the bonds that are present in the products. You form them, which is the exact opposite of breaking. And that's why we subtract 
the bond enthalpy, because the bond enthalpy would be for breaking it, so just change the sign, and that's what it would make for forming it. Now notice this means you don't change the sign yourself, the subtraction here is going to change the sign for you. That's kind of the way this works. Now, it turns out though, if we're going to look at all the different bonds, we have to be able to draw out the Lewis structures for all these lovely compounds. And so that's why we couldn't teach you this way back in chapter five. We had to first teach you how to draw these Lewis dot structures in this chapter. So if we take a look at CH4 here, and I highly recommend you just draw out your Lewis structures. So you can kind of keep track and look at all the bonds being broken and formed. And if you've got more than one molecule, here's just a one to one to one ratio, but I might even recommend drawing each separate molecule out. All right, so this is gonna form. CH3Cl and then plus HCl. Cool. So I'm not focusing too much on actually drawing out the Lewis structures. I'm giving them to you here, but uh, get some practice in on that last lesson because uh, this is another reason you need to be really good at drawing Lewis structures here. So, all right, so if we take a look at what's going on here, um, it turns out you can do all the bonds in the reactants minus all the bonds in the products, uh, and that'll get you a delta H, good approximation. So however, we'll find out that you can actually simplify your calculation in many cases and just do the bonds broken minus the bonds form. We'll find out if you do all the reactants minus all the products, in an example like this, this will be rather redundant and kind of a longer way to calculate this, but we'll do it both ways here. So if we look at this, we can just do all the bonds in the reactants, and in this case we got one, two, three, four of these CH bonds. And so in this case that means delta H here of the reaction is going to be four times 413 for the CH bonds, and then we have a CLCL bond, so that's one, just one of those, and so that's 242 kilojoules per mole. And so there's the sum of all the bonds in the reactants, and then we'll subtract the sum of all the bonds in the products. And again, we don't change the sign, the subtracting part of this changes the sign for you. So just use the, the bond enthalpy values right as they are in the chart here, and it's just reactants minus products. So here we've got three of these CH bonds again, so that's gonna be three times 413, plus now a single carbon chlorine bond, so one times 328, and then an HCl bond, so plus one times 431. And we've just got reactants minus products. Cool, and we'll work this out in a little bit. So, however, if you notice, we had four CH bonds over here that we're adding in, but we still had three of them over here, which we're now subtracting off. Well, if, we're, if three out of these four got added in, only be subtracted off from the get-go, well, then why not just leave it out of the equation and out of the calculation? It's just redundant, a little longer way to go. And that's what doing bonds broken minus bonds formed actually lets you do. So if you can recognize quickly which bonds are being broken and which ones are being formed, it'll shorten up the calculation for you. Now, if it's too difficult to notice which ones are being broken and formed, you can just, by all means, add up all the bonds that are present in the reactants and all the bonds that are present in the products and just do reactants minus products. But again, really important, it is reactants minus products. And the reason is because it's in the reactants where we're breaking bonds. And if we actually keep track of this, so this CH bond is one of the ones that's broken. I see that these three CH bonds are still present on the reactant side and the product side. And that's how you recognize what's broken and formed is just compare your reactant to your products. So reactants to your products. And so that's one that's broken, but this chlorine chlorine bond isn't present over here either. So that one's gotta get broken as well. And so on the reactant side, you find the bonds that are broken, and that's why we add in the bond enthalpies of the reactants, which are the ones that are broken. And again, that's what a bond enthalpy is. It's the energy it takes to break a bond. Now on the other side though, we're actually forming bonds. And we can see again by comparing the products to the reactants, what's the new bonds that are present? Well, in this case, we've got a new one forming right here. That's the CCL bond and a new one forming right here, that's the HCl bond. And again, we're not breaking these bonds, we're making them. And so notice, for a carbon-chlorine bond to break it, it would cost 328 kilojoules of energy. Well, when you form it, it actually releases 328 kilojoules of energy. But again, you're not supposed to change the sign yourself, that's what subtracting is going to accomplish for us. So when we do reactants minus products, the sign has already been changed for you. One of the biggest mistakes students will make is they'll subtract here, but also then change this to negative 13 and negative 328 and negative 431. Don't do that. If you're subtracting, like the formula says, that's changing the sign for you. 
All right. Now, if we just wanted to then do bonds broken minus bonds formed, it actually shortens up the calculation quite a bit here. Notice, uh, instead we just have the one CH bond, and so we just end up with one times 413, and the one CCL bond, so one times 242, put that in brackets, minus, and notice we don't even have to include these three bonds because they're not broken or formed, and we just jump right over to here, so one, times 328 plus 1 times 431. So which is definitely a much simpler calculation, but again, whether it's simpler to recognize what's being broken and formed or simpler just to do all the reactants minus all the products, uh, I will leave that in your hands and how comfortable you get by the time your exam rolls around. So, but if we do this here, we're going to do 413 plus 2, and I'll do the bottom one here, and I lost a parentheses there. So 413 plus 242 minus parentheses 328 plus 431 equals, and I'm going to get negative 104 kilojoules here. And that is an approximated value of our delta H of reaction. Now, if we had calculated out the delta H of this reaction using Hess's law or enthalpies of formation, we probably would have got a slightly different value than this that would have been a more accurate number. But again, this is still a really reasonable approximation for the delta H here. And we see being negative that this is an exothermic reaction. Let's do one more example. All right, so here's our second example here. And uh, this is going to demonstrate a couple of helpful things for us that the last one didn't do. And so one, we can take a look at a couple of trends here. So like if you compare the NH bond to the OH bond, 391 versus 463 kilojoules per mole, you'll notice that the OH bond takes more energy to break. It's a stronger bond. So, and what you learn is that if you're going across a period, like if I was to compare CH to NH to OH to FH, so that as the other atom besides hydrogen, gets more electronegative, the bond gets stronger. Now, it turns out size and electronegativity both play a role in the strength of a bond. Now, it turns out size probably has more of an impact, but if you're all in the same period, they're fairly close in size. And so electronegativity ends up being the determining factor. Now, if you were to compare the ones in, a gr in the same group, though, like if I compared HF to HCl to HBr to HI, so then you'd find out that size plays the bigger role in the smallest bond, would have been the HF bond, which would make it the strongest bond. It would have had the highest, largest bond enthalpy. And so if you're in the same group and you're comparing uh, all the same bond to the same atom, like in this case, all bonds to hydrogen from each of the halogens, uh, size is the determining factor in the smallest or shortest bond uh, is the strongest bond and has the, the largest bond enthalpy. But if you're comparing bonds in the same uh, period, like a CH, NH, OH, FH, electronegativity is the determining factor, and the more electronegative atom with that hydrogen in this case would be the stronger bond uh, and, the, and the larger bond enthalpy. So uh, you should also also know that, you know, typically single bond, double bond, triple bond, like a nitrogen, nitrogen, single bond is going to be weaker than a nitrogen, nitrogen, double bond, which is going to be weaker still than a nitrogen, nitrogen, triple bond. And so usually the more bonds you have between the same two atoms, the larger the bond enthalpy. And I say usually pretty much always. Uh, it's going to give you a larger bond enthalpy. However, it's not like, you know, a double bond is always going to be double the value of a triple bond. I'm sorry, double the value of a single bond. Or that a triple bond would be triple the value of bond enthalpy as a single bond. We see that's not the case here. Like your nitrogen-nitrogen single bond is 163. So, but your nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond is way more than triple that, it turns out. And so, uh, you know, that, that's going to have some important implications when we actually do the calculation here. So uh, something we'll ha definitely have to keep track of. So let's take a look at this example now that we've kind of looked at those trends here. So once again, we've got to draw some Lewis structures here. And uh, once again, also, since I've got two waters in this case, I highly recommend drawing both of them out as I'm about to do here. All right, you'll find out that I kind of made them with the angles that I did based on some things we'll learn in the next chapter about molecular geometry. So, but this is how all the bonds would work. And uh, in this case, a couple things. So one, if you try to go the whole broken versus formed thing, you'd find out that all the bonds in the reactants are being broken and all the bonds in the products are being formed, sort of. What's really happening, though, is that these nitrogens are probably bonded to each other the whole time, and we just end up with two additional bonds. However, with the way bond enthalpies are structured, you can't just like, well, let me just add the extra two bonds here. And we know the nitrogen, nitrogen single bond, so I'll just double that and add those two extra bonds. It doesn't work that way. When you go from a single to a double, or a double to a single, or a single to a triple, or a triple to a single, or, uh, between the same two atoms, you actually have to add or subtract them in 
uh, for the values for that particular bond. You can't just like try to do the extras. So in this case, if we look at all our bonds in the reactant side here, we've got one nitro-nitrogen single bond, that's gonna be 163. And then we've got four of these nitrogen hydrogen bonds, which are gonna be 391. And then we've got the oxygen oxygen double bond, which is gonna be 495. And then we'll subtract off all the products. We've got a nitro nitrogen triple bond for 941. So, and then we've got four of these oxygen hydrogen bonds, which are 463 each. Cool, and from here, we'll let our calculator do the work for us. So we've got 163 plus four times 391 plus 495 minus parentheses, 941 plus four times 463 parentheses, and we're gonna get negative 571. Cool. And again, there's a good approximation of the delta H for our reaction. And one more time, um, one, again, I drew out both waters. A lot of students will make the mistake of drawing only one. And instead of getting four of those OH bonds, they only account for two of them. So be careful with something like that. Uh, also, don't confuse this with enthalpy of formation value. And again, instead of bond enthalpy, if this had said something to the effect of like delta H sub F, those are enthalpies of formation, and if you're given those values in a table, that's when it's products minus reactants. And the idea is that in an enthalpy of formation, it's for something being formed. Well, what's actually getting formed? The reactants or the products? Well, it's the products that are getting formed. The reactants are getting unformed, and so it's the products that actually get added in. But we have to change the sign for the reactants because they're not getting formed, they're getting unformed, the exact opposite. And that's why for enthalpies of formation, it's products minus reactants. But again, with bond enthalpies, it's in the reactants that the bonds are being broken. And so with the way a bond enthalpy is defined as the energy it takes to break a bond, that's why it's reactants minus products. You really need to have a good handle on that. You really need to understand all the different ways you have of calculating delta H here, these three different ways, both uh, bond enthalpies, as we're doing in this lesson, reactants minus products, enthalpies of formation, products minus reactants, or Hess's law, which is the worst, where you gotta just like, you know, add up all the reactions and flip them around and double them and cut them in half whatever it does to add up to the reaction that's desired. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider hitting that like button? Best thing you can do to make sure YouTube shares this lesson with other students as well. And if you're looking for practice, if you're looking for quizzes and chapter tests and practice final exams, check out my General Chemistry Master course. I'll leave a link in the description. A free trial is available. Happy studying.